All righty, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, may have some other folks jumping on, but um, have a lot to cover and wanna make sure we can get through in an hour. Uh, my name is Sarah Haas, and I'm a director with the Enterprise Community Partners Southeast Market Office located here in Atlanta. I'm excited to be here today to present the new Southeast Preservation Toolkit, Tipping the Scale, which is focused on the preservation of small to medium multifamily properties, which we're defining as multifamily properties with 49 units or less. And we know that nationally, this property type actually provides the majority of affordable housing um, in our communities and isn't typically protected by a subsidy source or other affordability restrictions, meaning that it's kind of at the at risk of uh, loss of affordability as market changes happen. And right now, in the time of COVID and great uncertainty, um, given possible market changes and potential for property distress due to COVID impacts, we think that it's more important now than ever to prepare for preserving this key affordable housing in our communities. We're gonna um, take a look at this toolkit, which provides a real deep dive into Miami and Atlanta. But the central ideas and tenants that are shared throughout really can be applied anywhere and are really focused on the typology of properties. So we hope that this gets shared widely. Um, our office created this in partnership with Enterprise Advisors, which is the consulting arm of Enterprise. And I'm joined today by Zach Patton, Laura Searfoss, and Ann Jordan, who led this work. Um, we'll also be hearing from Leonard Adams, who's the president and CEO of Quest Communities, about their experience in small multifamily preservation at the end of the webinar. Uh, just a couple housekeeping items to note. You're all currently muted. Um, if you need to, would like to speak, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, we ask that you use the Q&A for questions throughout. Um, we'll largely be waiting until the end to answer those just due to timing. Uh, the chat function is disabled for this webinar, just using the Q&A. Um, and we are recording this webinar. So um, just note that. We'll share the link after the webinar as well. So I first wanna start with thanking the funders of our work. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without the generous funding of many different entities. Um, I wanna highlight funding from JP Morgan Chase, the NAE Casey Foundation, State Farm, and the Health Foundation of South Florida. Thank you again for your support of our work. I also wanna recognize the many people, um, some of whom are on this call, who helped us with this toolkit and participated in interviews, in review of materials, and in providing information on deals and your experiences. Um, nonprofit developers, for profit developers, public partners, banks, CDFIs, advocates, policymakers, and others. And um, if you check out the toolkit, there's a lengthy list of all the folks who engaged with us. So thank you again for the time and brain power you contributed to this work. So, just to give you an overview of what we'll cover today. So, first, we're going to talk about why we decided to create the toolkit and how we did it. Um, we'll then take some time walking through the online toolkit to give you a feel for what content you'll find and how to use it. And then we're going to spend a little time with a, a deep dive on tools that we feel are really critical, an evaluation scorecard and the interactive financial model. And then we'll end with the project profile section and actually get to hear from Leonard Adams, um, who has great experience at Quest Communities in um, acquisition and rehabilitation of small multifamily properties in in-town older communities. So first, um, I want to talk a little bit about why we decided to do this and how we got here. Um, so over the past four to five years, give or take, Enterprise has been really focused on affordable housing preservation um, with a specific focus in Atlanta and Miami. And in Atlanta, some of the work we've engaged in, uh, especially in thinking about the unsubsidized stock or NOAA stock, we've done analysis of the inventory of small to medium multifamily and in-town neighborhoods, also looking at ownership patterns of those uh, properties. We um, produced a report on the preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing a couple of years ago and highlighted specific recommendations that we felt would catalyze the preservation of those properties. And we now know, um, as of this morning or yesterday, I guess, that um, the housing opportunity bond um, legislation is back um, and there is a small multifamily set aside within that. So it's really exciting that there's some potential for new resources coming to this work. So I'm um, excited about that. Um, in addition, Enterprise right now is participating in some work in the NPUV communities, uh, looking at small multifamily preservation as a tool to help prevent displacement of families um, attending Gideon's Elementary School. So a lot of work has been happening and we feel like um, now is the time to uh, try to equip folks to uh, take advantage of this. Um, as we think about though, there's opportunity, but then what are we solving for? So over the course of our work, 
the first is one of capacity. Um, we don't have a lot of our kind of traditional nonprofit affordable housing developers or mission aligned for profit developers engaged in preservation of these smaller properties. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons, um, many of which actually are around lack of resources which um, are aligned with this property type. Uh, we also know though, that there's a lot of this stock which is at risk um, over the past few years is because uh, markets have been um, getting stronger in cities where we have a lot of these older properties. So we're seeing that either their value add acquisitions and rehabs or demolitions due to obsolescence and new construction on top. Um, and then again, on the resource side, we know that as we're building capacity and engaging new folks in this work, we have to have the capital to actually match with the deals. Um, this toolkit is very focused on developers. Um, it definitely has a kind of acquisition rehab frame. So nonprofit affordable housing developers and smaller for-profit mission aligned developers, but they're very much so our tools and information that would be helpful for existing owners who may be interested in stabilizing and rehabbing their properties and preserving that affordability for the long term. Um, and now uh, going to pass to Ann Jordan, who's going to talk with us a bit about how we actually develop this toolkit um, and uh, then jump into what's in it. Thanks, Sarah, thanks, Sarah. and yeah. thanks to thanks, everyone Sarah. for being here. I'm hearing a bit of an echo. Is that OK? Great. Um, so to talk about how we got here a little bit, um, we thought about these goals, what we were solving for, um, and really wanted to make sure we weren't duplicating effort. Like if these resources existed already, um, there was no need for us to regurgitate that. So we conducted a thorough literature review of existing reports and recommendations about unsubsidized SMMF properties and preservation, um, and really found that most existing resources focused on the preservation of larger or subsidized properties, pretty similar to the financing landscape for preservation itself. So we use those to identify likely impacts on smaller unsubsidized properties that we were focused on. And then from there, we conducted interviews with more than 50 experts, including developers, funders, realtors, nonprofits, and local government staff. Um, just like Sarah acknowledged during the initial thank you, and many people we interviewed were working specifically in Atlanta or Miami or provided national expertise. We also interviewed experts from other markets where more of this work to preserve SMMF unsubsidized properties is already underway to identify any replicable lessons learned. And these activities plus additional quantitative and qualitative research provided the foundation for each of the tools we'll discuss today. So if we go to the next slide, I'll share a little bit more about what's actually in the toolkit. It really follows the preservation process, as you can see here in this table of content snapshot, highlighting common barriers and tips for success at each stage along the way. There are locally relevant data and spotlights, plus interactive tools that are integrated throughout, and we'll provide a deep dive on some of those in just a bit. Some of the specific information in this toolkit includes data on the unsubsidized SMMF housing stock nationally and in Atlanta and Miami, notes on how your key partners may be different or their expectations may be different in this kind of deal, tips on identifying strong SMMF targets for preservation, guidance on financing that's available for these types of projects and how to make the funding work all the way through deal negotiation and closing, key considerations that may impact your rehabilitation plan, and finally, some low-cost property management solutions. But across all of these, there are a couple key strategies for success that emerged, and that is what we will focus on to walk through the toolkit today. These really cut across some of those different stages, and so Sarah and I will break these up and talk about how this toolkit can help you implement these strategies to preserve SMMF NOAA in Atlanta. So with that, um, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, on the next slide, I believe we also have the link about where you can click on the toolkit yourself. Um, so you can click around and see what's happening while we're walking through it. And that is sepreservation.enterprisecommunity.org. Um, and that is what I am going to share right now. So let's see, and there we should all see it. 
So this is what you see when you go to the home screen of the toolkit. And uh, at the very end in the conclusion is where we have these overarching strategies for success. So the first one is portfolio-based approaches for economies of scale. We know that when you're pursuing the preservation of multiple unsubsidized affordable SMMF properties at the same time, particularly if those multiple properties are located near one another, it can help you achieve greater economies of scale and increase your access to financial products, which improves the feasibility of different rehabilitation components and can expand efficient options for property management and ongoing operations. This strategy may particularly impact the partners you work with and your property management practices. Um, so I'll use this opportunity to share a little bit about uh, relationship building section and property management section of the toolkit. So navigating to the relationship building section, we not only outline the key types of partners that in partnerships that you may want to build during a preservation deal, uh, but also talk about how they may differ during an SMMF preservation project from relative to a larger or subsidized preservation project. And then we also outline some of the key stakeholders in Atlanta and Miami specifically um, that may be helpful to involve. And there are links throughout to click on these partners and find out ways to work more closely together. On the property management side of things, there is more information on the need for economies of scale a project spotlight on an innovative property management approach that really implements this strategy, as well as some additional tips on how to further minimize operating expenses. So if we scroll through here, we can see a little bit more on that narrative component around the importance of this strategy, that project spotlight that I mentioned that, that features Oaks ATL um, based in Atlanta, as well as some ways to operate uh, to minimize operating expenses right here um, and an overview of some of the key expenses expected in the Atlanta market. Finally, I wanted to highlight related to this strategy, one of our three project profiles. You'll hear about one of them later today, but another one that we won't hear as much about is this pro project profile, the Washington at Woodlawn Park, uh, which shows how a POA um, a developer used this strategy to preserve 16 SMMF buildings in Chicago, really implementing this strategy well. Um, and you'll find keys to success that we took away from this deal, some financing uh, breakdowns, more information on the developer, the project, and so on. So with that, uh, that's a little teaser there, and then we'll go into the second overarching strategy, uh, which is about strategic acquisition. And this is really about all those choices that are made during property identification that have far reaching effects on the other stages of the preservation process and the project's long term viability. Since we know that calibrating these choices to surrounding market conditions is critical, we provide some information about that and recommend some key considerations around property acquisition for SMMF preservation including if the property can be acquired off market, if it's in a neighborhood where you already work or have deeper relationships, if the property does not need major repairs, and if it does not require tenant relocation. And to enable this kind of strategic acquisition strategy, we know it's important to understand the SMMF landscape in your market. So in the introduction, we provide some details on what that looks like in Atlanta and Miami specifically. There's data on the distribution of SMMF properties by size, level of affordability, and whether they are subsidized or not. This can help you identify how your acquisition strategy may fit into the larger landscape, especially as you make the case for your project to others. And so here is that data that we talked about in a narrative format. We also provide some uh, interactive gra uh, graphs and charts that you can hover over and see additional data on. Uh, I'll also note that in some of these figures as you explore, uh, you'll see that we used renter median income to talk about income levels and affordability. 
which may be a little different than you've seen in other places since often area median income is used. Um, but we know that captures both homeowners and renter median income. And since this toolkit is really around how the unsubsidized SMMF stock uh, meets important needs of renters, we really wanted to focus on that with this information. And you can see when you look at the units affordable, different income levels in the Atlanta metro area, for example, just how much of the SMMF universe is serving these lower renter income levels relative to the affordable housing stock as a whole. There's a lot more details on these calculations um, and how we got there that's available in Appendix 1, quantifying the unsubsidized affordable SMMF housing stock. So from there, I'll highlight some things in the property identification section as well, which provides information and tools to guide this process, including evalu evaluation scorecards that can help you pick among potential preservation targets based on likely project feasibility, which Laura will talk about in just a little bit in more depth. These scorecards walk you through four key considerations for SMMF property identification related to property characteristics, project feasibility, neighborhood market conditions, and neighborhood access to amenities and resources. This section discusses the impacts of various market conditions on your identification strategy. It provides tips for how to engage with brokers and uh, owners of properties as you consider property identification strategies, plus some local considerations specific to Atlanta and Miami to account for when developing an acquisition strategy which were developed by, by talking with many of the people on the phone today and some who were not, as well as reviewing local plans that were incorporated into the evaluation scorecard. So with that, I'll pass the screen back to Shara to finish the overview of the toolkit before Lauren Zach provide a deeper dive. Great, thanks, Anne. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. All right, so everyone should be seeing the website on my screen now. Um, I'm going to start off with talking a bit about financing. So if we can go back to our concluding strategies. Um, one that is no surprise to everyone is financing right size to market conditions and property needs. And we know that this is a, um, especially a significant challenge for this stock because they're small deals. Um, but you know, they still are as costly to do, um, and there just aren't as many resources out there, especially kind of the more traditional affordable housing resources. So I just want to highlight a few um, components of the toolkit to help you think through this piece. First, if we go to the securing financing section, um, some things we've done here. First, we do have the financial modeling tool. I'll show you that in the tools and download section in a second, and then Zach will actually be walking us through that in more detail. And then second, we've tried to highlight some national resources available um, that can be used to preserve these properties, um, as well as resources that are specific to um, disaster recovery and hazard mitigation. Um, and lastly, we've highlighted some resources in Atlanta and Miami, which may be specifically applicable to this property type. Now I'm going to go to the tools and downloads section. Again, our financial modeling tool. Zach will walk you through this as a very detailed downloadable version and then also the interactive version with a one for Atlanta and one for Miami. And then next in our tools and downloads section, I'm gonna highlight the financing resource guides, which we've created for Atlanta and Miami. These are interactive financial uh, resource guides. Um, right now, these are very inclusive, um, in the sense that the majority of the currently available uh, public and then some private resources are included. Um, and the reason we did that is that um, A, resource priorities change and shift. Um, and B, if you are thinking about small multifamily, for example, in terms of an assemblage of multiple properties in your portfolio, some tools such as the low income housing tax credit might actually become available um, to you. So to utilize this, you're able to actually change some drop downs at the top. Um, and then if you click, you'll get detail on that property or on that resource. And then you can actually click to the resource provider website. What we wanted to do here is provide some overview information, um, but directly link you to the resource provider because again, priorities um, and availability of resources change constantly. And we wanna make sure that this tool can live on um, and not uh, be out of date immediately. 
So we will be working to keep this updated on an ongoing basis, but always recommend that folks go specifically um, to the website that is provided to you. So again, just some other examples. The second now um, strategy I want to highlight is reducing transaction costs. So again, while these projects are smaller, transaction costs are not necessarily smaller. And so we need to find ways to be as efficient as possible, um, as well as um, we think that having strong relationships and systems in place capacity are really key to making these deals actually work. So I'm going to highlight the negotiation and deal closing section of the toolkit. Um, and here we've highlighted um, common pitfalls and challenges that you might um, experience. And while these are things that of course could occur with any property size, we do think they're really specific to um, existing preservation um, or preservation of existing properties. So for example, title issues, um, issues with contamination or environmental issues and appraisal gaps, and especially that can be an issue in um, markets which are getting much stronger, um, where a property and its use as an affordable housing property um, may actually have a much higher sales price um, because that's predicated on a different use. Um, we also provide some dips for um, handling negotiation and deal closing. Um, and we have a set aside deep dive into the need for relationships with your partners. I also want to then remind folks of the relationship building section that Anne um, went over before. Um, this is key to start to think through who all the different folks are that you would want to engage with. Um, throughout the preservation of these properties. And then lastly, I want to highlight materials. So as we think about preservation and older properties and wanting to keep them sustainable and affordable for the long term, I think it's really critical that we focus on materials that wear well over their life cycle. Um, and so we've got some um, information around energy efficiency um, as well as disaster resilience. So if we look here in the tools and downloads, you'll see you're able to download energy efficiency guides. Let me just show you those. This is my child. <laughs> um, so these are the energy efficiency guides and scope of works for Florida, scopes of work for Florida and Georgia. Um, these are created by our green communities team um, as a as limited scope for use in planning for rehab that would enable you to identify ways to improve energy efficiency, water efficiency, and quality of your multifamily housing. Um, we've identified things that are low or no cost and that could be used either in context of a larger renovation rehab or it could be used for individual um, repairs or replacement, such as um, the need to identify um, a toilet that meets certain water efficiency goals. Um, again, these are specific to each state and reference code and rebates. Um, but with that, want to make sure that we remind folks to you know, go to those codes. Um, when you're ready to do this to make sure that um, things are as up to date as possible. The other tool that we did create, it's a very simple tool, is a resilience assessment template that would just enable you to have a, a checklist to identify um, various hazards that your multifamily building might be at risk of. Um, we are actually also working on um, some additional more detailed tools that we'll be able to share um, in early 2021 with regards to resilience. Um, and an enterprise has a new online portfolio risk assessment tool, which we'll share the link to that um, as well for folks. So now, back to the website, um, we're going to spend some time on a deep dive um, of some of these tools. And so um, we're going to look at the evaluation scorecard and we're going to take a look then at the financial modeling toolkit, or financial modeling tool, excuse me. And so I'm going to pass to Laura Searfoss, who's going to take us through the evaluation scorecards. Thanks, uh, good to be here today. So as Anne and Sarah uh, laid out in their remarks, you know, there's a lot of different factors to account for when looking for strong preservation opportunities, especially for unsubsidized small and medium multifamily housing. And so the evaluation scorecard is really designed to help mission aligned developers and investors evaluate what a strong opportunity looks like building on those four factors that Anne outlined as part of property identification. Um, to give a little bit of background about how the scorecard was developed, first and foremost, um, it really benefited from kind of three qualitative inputs. The first was a scan of national best practices related to this property type 
as well as preservation of affordability more generally. The second was a content analysis or review of local, uh, local plans um, specific to Miami to really understand what are the priorities for housing, um, affordable housing, populations, place, things like that. And then finally, a review of local data sources to assist with um, completing the evaluation scorecard that really then helps rely on um, commonly used sources of data in Miami. Um, sorry, and in Atlanta. Um, so in the case, um, so I'm going to now share my screen um, to show a completed uh, scorecard. Um, and so, as Sarah mentioned, you can download this directly from the website. Uh, we have a different one for Atlanta and Miami because there are different considerations uh, based on that local context that I mentioned. Um, and when you download it, you're, um, you'll see that there's two tabs. So the first tab is the evaluation itself. The second tab is um, essentially aligned with the prompts on the evaluation considerations uh, for completing it, as well as data sources and how the scoring works. Um, so moving back to the evaluation itself, there's kind of four primary factors that it's based on. The first is property characteristics, and this is things like age of property, um, current affordability level, uh, affordability level once um, preserved and also relocation because we heard that was really critical in um, making determinations about preservation. The second factor is project feasibility and this is pretty wide ranging in terms of what it encompasses. It includes both the ability of the property to meet current land use uh, and building standards as well as eligibility for public funding and buyer and owner relationships. The third factor is neighborhood market conditions, and this is really used as a proxy for market activity is um, specifically if small and medium multifamily um, or affordability more generally is at risk of being lost in these areas, uh, both from a current perspective, but also uh, a future looking perspective around anticipated market activity. Um, and this also includes uh, resident displacement risk. And then the final one, neighborhood access and amenities is really focused on assessing the locational factors around the properties um, that help it connect to access to opportunity and promote economic mobility. And so you can see things here like health services, parks and recreation, access to transit, short commute times, things like that. Once complete, um, you get a, the, um, once you complete the evaluation, it scores it. Uh, the total possible score for Atlanta you could get is 33. While there's no kind of higher, you know, scoring threshold where, you know, property that scores over a certain number is a good preservation opportunity and one that scores lower is not. Uh, but the way the scoring is structured is that the higher the score, the uh, better pre that preservation opportunity aligns with local priorities for housing affordability as well as overall project feasibility for this specific property type. Um, so as you can see here, the uh, ones we've pre-populated uh, for demonstration purposes today have pretty similar scores, um, not a ton of variation. And you know, this is also, I think, a time where depending on what matters to your organization, you may want to go back into specific factors or even individual criterion to begin to understand you know, if, for instance, uh, risk of displacement is really important, then um, some properties may be better suited for that versus um, if certain locational factors are really important, you may um, use that to, to complete this evaluation. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Zach Patton, to walk us through the other tool related um, as part of this toolkit, the financial modeling tool. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, 
So I'm Zach Patton with Enterprise Advisors, and um, I have the pleasure today of telling you about the financial modeling tool. Let me share my screen here with you. Okay. So um, the financial modeling tool um, is uh, part of the online toolkit that we've been looking at, and so we'll take a look um, in just a moment at the web version. Um, but I did want to just tell you a little bit, of, uh, give you a, a quick overview of it first. So the tool is based on a pro forma model, which estimates annual revenue and costs over time to paint a picture of a given project's financial viability, given a set of assumptions that we have included, and then inputs from uh, you in uh, that are going to specify information about the project, the financing for the project, um, costs associated with it, and, and so forth. So the goal of this tool is really to provide a high-level go or no-go assessment based on the overall financial feasibility, and then also to report out some additional evaluation metrics that are interviews with stakeholders, developers, lenders, uh, determined where um, going to be relevant for thinking about the, uh, the, the viability of the project. So before we take a look at the actual tool itself, I wanted to just take a moment to point out a few key considerations that we are working with um, in our approach in creating this tool. So the first is that, and uh, this is probably familiar to any of you who have worked on tools before, we're really trying to strike a balance between flexibility and simplicity for the user. Um, so on the one hand, we didn't want to create a model or a tool that was so complex and had so many inputs and outputs that people would be intimidated and not want to use the tool um, or it would be too time consuming for a kind of quick go, no, go um, uh, assessment. But on the other hand, we wanted enough complexity and nuance that the results were going to be accurate and there was going to be enough flexibility um, that could, it could accommodate a variety of scenarios that you all might be interested in assessing. Um, so that was kind of a constant question that we were asking ourselves and struggling with as we were creating it. And so one way we struck that balance was by trying to do as much of the work for you as we could. Um, so identifying and vetting assumptions that could apply in the majority of cases, um, also making those transparent and allowing the users to change those if they needed to. Um, the second thing we did was really uh, creating two different versions of the tool. So one version that we'll look at is a simplified, a, a more simple web-based interactive tool um, that requires fairly minimal inputs from the user to get a result. Um, and uh, we really just focused on those inputs that we heard in our research were going to um, have substantial variation between projects. And then the uh, that, that tool also does a little more hand-holding in, in sort of breaking up and um, focusing attention on each decision point as you go through it. And then the second tool, the second version of the tool that we'll look at is a bit more uh, uh, comprehensive in scope and a lot more flexible. Um, it is a downloadable Excel version and um, it gives you much uh, more full control over uh, modifying the assumptions that we made and building the model and so forth. You can even edit the model itself if you choose to. So um, if you're just looking to plug in a few quick numbers and see what um, general feasibility looks like under a set of standard conditions, then you can use the online tool. Um, if you want to dig further in and modify those assumptions or integrate the, the uh, model into other Excel-based tools that you might already be using, then you're welcome to um, use that the downloadable version and um, do that as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the online tool. So the financial modeling tool can be found uh, here within the toolkit itself. And if you look at the menu here, you'll see it here under tools and downloads. Um, if we look at the uh, top up here, you can see where you can download the um, more flexible tool that we'll look at in a moment for the relevant market. 
Um, and then if we scroll down, we'll see the interactive version down here. Um, and I should mention here that if you're interested in um, the methods and assumptions and a data dictionary, things like that, you can click on the relevant link here to see the technical documentation. All right, so let's take a look at the interactive version first. Um, this interface, as I mentioned, is pre-populated with data based on local market conditions, um, affordability limits, and um, preservation approaches that are more prevalent. So um, you have some starting values and assumptions to work with, but it's still going to require some level of input by um, the user to account for the specifics of a given property and the unit mix and the plan for capital sources and so on. So the first decision you have to make is what market you are working in. So we will choose Atlanta. And you'll see here that the um, tool now opens. Um, so we, I should say in, in thinking about the market, we built uh, these tools with users in mind who are working in the greater Atlanta, or in the case of Miami, greater Miami regions, not just Atlanta as a city itself. Um, but I will say that because there's variation in some of the assumptions, um, oh, some of these are some of the assumptions are based on you know property tax rates or or things like that that are that are specific to the city. Um, so you definitely want to pay close attention to some of those factors if you are working um, in the broader county or municipalities outside of Atlanta itself. So after we pick our market, we now have the ability to navigate. Um, through different topic areas that you see over here on the sidebar. Um, so in this first one, preservation type, you see some, uh, we're being asked to specify a per unit rehabilitation cost for our project. And then you can see up here, there's some guidance about what uh, different preservation costs might look like. Um, and so throughout, you'll see either information um, that is presented or links to different sections of the toolkit that could provide some additional context for some of those decision points. Thinking about the, um, the uh, sections here and in inputs, we have preservation uh, type, which we're looking at now, which is really about the per unit cost of rehabilitation. We have um, under property characteristics, things like property tax rates, um, whether the building has um, non-residential rentable space as well as residential space. Affordability covers um, primarily the mix of unit sizes and rents that you would be expecting um, post uh, any kind of uh, rehabilitation or um, redevelopment that you'd be doing as part of the project. Preservation costs includes some place-based considerations like um, the um, acquisition cost um, and um, whether accessibility um, accommodations are going to be required as part of the development process. And um, capital sources covers our, uh, or allows you to specify your debt, equity, and then a few different forms of subsidy that you might encounter as part of your project. Um, so across those characteristics are those um, sections. Um, we, there's a number of uh, things that we can specify. We don't have time to walk through each of those sections in depth today, but I did want to point out just a, a few general things about how we design this. So first, throughout the tool, that you'll notice that there are two main um, colors that you'll see numbers and um, values associated with. So the first are blue boxes, which are uh, really outputs and contextual values from the model. And the second is green boxes, which are the boxes that are meant to be inputs that you are being asked to respond to in some way. Um, so that makes it easy to figure out uh, where we need to be concerned about specifying inputs. And that, that color coding is, is consistent across both the interactive version and the downloadable version of the model so that you can more easily switch back, between, back and forth between those. Uh, the second thing is that as we navigate through each section, you'll see that the top, let me move on my video, there we go. Um, the top of each section has this project summary view. Um, and so you'll see uh, our set of evaluation metrics. 
So first we have our overall feasibility indicator over here. And um, that feasibility indicator is really based on two criteria. Number one is whether the project is expected to meet the target internal rate of return for both the developer and um, outside uh, investors or other sources of equity. And um, number two is whether it meets an assumed debt service coverage ratio um, that our research determined would be prevalent among lenders in the market, which I believe for Atlanta is uh, 1.15. Uh, but I will also say that was established prior to the pandemic. And so to the extent there's been um, different expectations that lenders are setting, that might be one of the um, things that you would want to explore using the downloadable version, because that's not something that we offered as an input in the interactive version here. Um, so if both of those criteria are met, the criteria are met, the internal rate of return and the debt service coverage ratio, then we say that the, the project has a base level of feasibility from the perspective of um, securing capital. Um, if those criteria are not met, and I can just let's say that we encountered a 5% property tax rate. Um, if those criteria are not met, then um, this box is going to turn red and tell you the deal is not feasible because one of those conditions um, is not being met. And then the model is also going to estimate a total amount of upfront subsidy that would be required um, in order for this project to work. So that could be in the form of a deferred interest forgivable loan, something like that, um, that this, this project would receive um, upfront. Um, so then we could go back to our inputs across any of our sections here and try to make adjustments to see uh, maybe we include that source of, of um, subsidy in our capital sources, or uh, maybe we, we realize, oh, we could actually uh, maybe get a bit of a lower property tax rate and um, bring that, that subsidy needed down or uh, eliminate it altogether. Um, so that's our basic feasibility uh, measure. And then over here, you'll see a series of other evaluation metrics uh, because we realized that uh, debt service coverage ratio and um, IRR are not the only ways of thinking about whether a project is, is feasible or desirable. So um, based on our interviews, we added some additional measures here to help um, folks evaluate the project. Um, so with that, let's uh, uh, transition over to the downloadable version of the tool. Um, so this, uh, again, if we are in the page here, we can click on um, the button here to download it. And when we open it, we will see two tabs in, in, uh, in Excel uh, workbook. So the first one has instructions and um, talks about the color coding and where you can find information about the documentation and so forth. One uh, piece I did want to point out here is that the model itself is password protected, but we do give you the password in the instructions sheet. So we just think password protected it to keep people from accidentally making changes to the model that might um, distort the results. So, but if you do want to modify um, anything in the model, you can type in the password here, which is preservation. So looking at the model itself, you can see that the information is organized according to the same categories as the online tool. You'll see the same um, green boxes highlighted here that are highlighted in the um, online tool. Um, but you'll also see a lot of blue boxes that didn't show up in the online tool that you can now modify. So let's say that um, we, if we go down to capital sources, Let's say that uh, we, we did experience um, lenders in, uh, because of the pandemic wanting to um, impose a, a higher threshold for debt service coverage ratio. We could come down here, find that line, and modify that accordingly and see what the impact would be on our, the same evaluation metrics that we saw in the tool. And if we keep scrolling down, we can get to the model itself. and so. As I mentioned, uh, we could modify that um, accordingly. 
So we don't have time to go through any detailed examples or case studies today. Um, so with that quick demo, I will um, just close my remarks by saying that this is a really interesting tool for us to develop, and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback from folks um, that we interviewed to create it, both in terms of the content and the simplicity of use. So we're really hoping that um, it will end up being a useful tool for you as well in your work. Um, and we'd really love to hear feedback from you on it if you are finding it useful and um, if you have ideas for how we could improve it to the extent we end up um, working on future iterations of this. So I will, with that, I will um, pass things back over to Sarah. Thanks, Zach. And um, Zach, I am going to cover one question right now because it is related to the interactive modeling tool. Um, sure. So we have a question. Um, are these figures outputs of the process or assumptions populated at the front? And I think that's related to kind of the blue outputs that are at the top of the interactive model. Um, and I think if you can remind folks um, where they can find more details on those assumptions, also, that'd be great. Yes. So the, um, the blue information up here, um, these are outputs of the model. So they do have some assumptions built into them that again, in the downloadable tool, you would be able to modify, but these are all going to adjust according to our um, inputs here. So if we have, if we watch um, one of these values, let's say um, total upfront cost per unit, um, is in with this default set of inputs, 80,000. Um, so if we went to our preservation costs and we ended up not being able to uh, acquire this for 680,000, but let's say it was closer to 800,000, then um, I don't remember what we said the number was before, but let's say it was a million. So you can see these numbers are adjusting based on our set of inputs. So these are not um, targets. These are not um, you know, desired conditions. These are estimations of what this, how this project would actually perform over a 10-year um, uh, time horizon based on the inputs, and the, um, the inputs by you and then the assumptions that we had to make on the back end. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are now, um, I'm gonna share my screen again. I'm gonna talk a bit about project profiles. So um, as Anne noted earlier, we have three project profiles which are included in the toolkit. Um, we have one for Miami, one for Atlanta, and one that is national, is the assemblage that she highlighted before. Um, and we're actually lucky today that we are going to get to hear from Leonard Adams with Quest Communities. I'm going to highlight when you go to the toolkit, you go to project profiles, you can click on each one, and then you're able to learn more about how each developer made the deal happen and made it work, um, and what some of the challenges were um, in doing that. We've got details on the financing sources and all the different um, aspects of the preservation process. So with that, um, I'm going to pass us to Leonard Adams, President and CEO of Quest Communities to walk us through his experience with preserving small multifamily. And thanks so much, Leonard, for joining us today. Excuse me. Thank you, Sarah. And good morning to everyone on the call. Uh, I want to say thank you to Enterprise for even putting something like this together as the presenters uh, and the hosts going through the toolkit. I thought back 20 years thinking, wow, I would have loved to have something like this um, back then, uh, because it is a unique and it's a, a complex uh, configuration or calculation to how to do a uh, single family, uh, I mean, small multifamily. Uh, and and, the, and the, the, the start that we use at Quest is the need, because if we, if we start trying to figure out immediately how this deal is going to perform financially, it will cause us to probably walk away right in the beginning. Um, but because the need is there in the particular communities that Quest serves, I'm very interested on how these small multifamilies are in these communities of choice and thriving communities that we see all the time that are tucked and scattered over Atlanta and they're, they're performing and fully occupied. 
it's a different animal when you, and I maybe shouldn't use the word animal, but it's a difference when you catch these small multifamily buildings that are in underserved communities or underinvested communities. And not only are they um, in substandard conditions, some of them have gotten to a point that even a gut rehab uh, takes your numbers a little bit um, out of whack. So I wanted to introduce myself again as Leonard Adams, President and CEO of Quest Communities. Uh, Quest Community Development Organization is a nonprofit. We've been around 19 years here in Atlanta, and we made our mark in developing small apartment communities for homeless individuals that were living with a um, disability of mental illness or substance addiction meaning most of them had zero to very limited income. And the single, I'm sorry, the small multifamily apartment buildings were very attractive for permanent supportive housing. Uh, one, because we didn't think we could afford anything else uh, other than something that was a six or eight unit, 10 unit building that we were looking to house individuals that um, only could pay margin, uh, a very small amount of money towards rent. So we were we are established in a West Side community of Vine City. We serve nine communities in the West Side, and this West Side is uh, scattered with small multifamily. So today's uh, pro property overview is a project that we were um, looking to advance our portfolio of small multifamily to leverage our property management arm and our uh, infrastructure to how to uh, look at how does how would our portfolio perform because when you look at these properties as individuals a lot of times it says financially you might need to walk away from it but if you're able to uh, put together a portfolio that have some of the um, geographical um, leverages that are close enough to uh, allow you to leverage your maintenance and your property management staff that they're managing all of this scattered site uh, multifamily versus a hundred unit or 200 unit uh, nine percent uh, or four percent bond deal. So let's look at some of the uh, things that made this a key to success in this particular side of town. One, we were in this side of town for as I stated, 19 years, and we have been planning and targeting uh, the hardest hit properties. And that just brought uh, an easier conversation because nobody really wants these abandoned buildings next door to them. So we targeted those hard to uh, develop products. Um, this one, we were just uh, had an easier lift because one of our partners, Invest Atlanta, actually put together a program to go out and secure small multifamily and single family properties and then put those properties back out for development RFP for uh, developers, particularly Chodos that were in the area that had a history of developing such. So we were able to apply to Invest Atlanta. And we were selected or won that RFP to be the developer to develop this 12 unit uh, to build an apartment community uh, in an underserved community that was completely empty, that had been um, vandalized, uh, no tenants, so there were no relocation, uh, but there were pr uh, plenty of additional uh, ailments to the building that you probably wouldn't find if it was an occupied building and you were trying to relocate and then rehab. So we had uh, gone through the property, and Quest is big on green building. So we were able to uh, get our green consultant to look at the facility as a, a, as a preservation deal and tell us what could we do to save us money uh, and also the tenant money and, and ultimately um, the resident uh, uh, money and, uh, monthly and annually. So we were able to build a relationship as the team and the toolkit shows you, we were able to build a relationship with a funder that was looking for our type of model. We were able to secure funding from them, a loan from them at a, at a decent uh, rate. We were also able to attract uh, money from the city, our other government par partners, um, as a CHODO, a 30 year permanent uh, loan that uh, with a 1% a interest rate, and then we had this gap or this subsidy that was needed 
as uh, Zachary talked about, the tool will tell you if the deal is feasible or not, or if you're going to need some soft money to make the deal work. And without using this the tool, because we didn't have it at the time, we knew that we couldn't carry any more debt, so we needed to have some soft funds. And this is where we found the uh, relationship to, to reach out to Partners for Home, which is looking to provide uh, acquisition and or construction dollars for uh, apartment units where individuals could be housed that had experienced homelessness. And since that is what our mission was around, this aligned very well with residents that were currently in the community that was experiencing homelessness on the west side and to be targeted for those individuals to be referred to this new development. As the financial sources show, the total development cost was 1.3 million roughly. Uh, if you go down, uh, Zachary or, or Sarah, that's with the slides. This was a, about in construction costs around $78,000 per unit. If you noticed on the toolkit that Zachary was reviewing, it said 60,000 or greater. Uh, this is where we landed. Um, 78,000 is a, a number that we've seen consistent over the last few years of a total gut rehab. Um, the only thing that keeps it at that number is because of the acquisition cost was not there. We are doing a long-term ground lease with Invest Atlanta for 65 years, which took that cost away from this, uh, this budget. So for example, if we had to buy this for 180, 150, that would add about another $15,000, $20,000 to this construction cost number. And now you're really getting out of whack on, uh, can you hold that type of debt? A uh, few more things. Um, you don't have to um, do an earth craft or, or, or uh, um, I forget the other one. You don't have to do the green certification, but we found that even going through the, uh, certification process and learning where we can get some wins uh, that will gain us efficiencies and all ultimately the tenants. And typically those are the appliances that are energy efficient, uh, the windows, um, HVAC, uh, and those are some of the, 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 the major ones that we use, um, not really the solar uh, at this time, even though we have grown into using solar. So I wanna wrap up with um, this, this project also was able to have reserves which were required by the funding sources um, at I believe is 250 uh, per unit. Um, we also were able to uh, make some developer fees off of this. So if you're, if these organizations are looking at um, putting together a portfolio of small multifamily, uh, the developer fees are, I wouldn't say they're, they're extremely small, but they're, they're not transformational uh, um, at this time. But you have to be very careful about these because you find yourself on these gut rehabs. Once you get into them, uh, some of the number one items that we found that causes the budget to grow is actually the plumbing that is running from the site to connect to the uh, public right away uh, for sewer and water. Uh, typically, we wouldn't have uh, included that in the development, uh, but every small multifamily that we've done over the last seven years, we've had to replace that line uh, and also run a sprinkler uh, line as well, which is additional costs uh, that wasn't there previously. So um, it's 12 units, it's five, two bedroom, 10 two bedrooms and one one bedrooms. The rents are at 30% or I would say 50% AMI or lower. Uh, these will have vouchers on them from the housing authority. And what helps on these vouchers is uh, or to help this deal pencil better is that the uh, vouchers are at 60% AMI. So we're able to get a little bit more money uh, without impacting what the actual tenant would pay the 30% of their income. So just wanted to fast, uh, fast track through this and Sarah, I will take uh, any questions if this is proper at this time. All right, thanks so much, Leonard. I appreciate you walking us through your experience and um, 
sharing this deal with us and with the toolkit. Um, so we're just about at time. Um, just looking again, if, if folks want to put any additional questions in the Q&A, please do. Um, I just want to highlight one question which was posed um, and apologize for not answering this while Zach was speaking. Um, when using the tool, and this I uh, wasn't sure at the time it was toolkit or the financial modeling tool, is it only viable for Atlanta and Miami or can we use it for other locations? So the toolkit overall um, definitely has applicability beyond Atlanta, Miami um, and many of the more general sections. The financial model could be generally applicable in other places, but there are market specific considerations you might want to make and modifications to assume values. So an example Zach provided in Miami, there are rules which dictate whether a project needs to include hurricane resilience measures. So we included that in the model for Miami, but it wouldn't be applicable in all places or other markets might have other pieces like that. Another example might be that lenders might have different expectations for rates or debt service coverage ratio thresholds in different markets, but you could account for those things um, and then you would be able to use it in other places. So thanks Zach for that. Um, so we are um, a couple minutes over and appreciate everyone for joining us today and thank you also to all of our presenters. Um, we'll follow up um, again with um, the link to the toolkit um, and I'll put that up though right now as well for folks. Um, as well as we have recorded this session and we'll be sharing that with everyone too. So thank you again to everyone and have a great Friday and weekend. Thank you.